Hello, 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 and welcome to The Experience TV. It's a live show about the economic revolution that you and I are living through right now, the experience economy. This is the world where brands are competing on the quality of their customer experiences, and this show is all about how and what you should do about it. I'm your host, Katie Martell. Say hello if you're watching live. You can also ask questions on demand in the comment sections on LinkedIn, and you will want to ask questions today because my guest, is fantastic. Listen, hello to everyone if you're watching this on demand as well. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, Oracle Customer Experience uh, and SmarterCX.com, which is where, by the way, you can find all of today's uh, resources, the notes, the links I'm going to mention throughout a transcript of today's episode if you are multitasking as you should be, and all of the past episodes that we've done. Uh, so thank you, Oracle CX, for sponsoring this. We appreciate it. Um, and like I said, my guest today is somebody that I have just, uh, I don't, I, is this weird to say? He's in the green room. He can hear me. But is it weird to say I've grown up with Jay Bear? Like my whole career, I've learned so much from Jay Bear. Um, and today is no uh, exception. I have a series of questions for him, and I hope you all ask as well. Uh, but the questions I have today are about the kind of state of business right now, particularly with growth. Uh, I'm going to be asking him about what growth looks like in 2021, a very strange year, and why he thinks this. He said to me, 2021 is the single greatest opportunity for business since the advent of the internet. Those are some heavy words, and uh, here to explain it all will be Jay Bear in just a bit. So stay tuned for Jay. Ask questions throughout. I'm monitoring on LinkedIn. Hi, Kate. Oh, Kate, like Kate, my friend Kate Scott likes my blazer. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, and thank you all again for tuning in. Um, so guys, today I have a, a really cool piece of technology that I, I want to start with. It's my technology of the week, deep fake. If you've heard of deep fake technology, let me know in the comments and let me know what you think about it, particularly in the context of customer experience. If you're not familiar with deep fake technology, this is like technology that creates video, but it's not real video. It's a person's face that's been morphed to say or do something they didn't say or do. It's fascinating. Uh, it uses artificial intelligence and it creates these videos in a variety of contexts. Some of those contexts have been described as terrifying, dangerous. Some have been described as a threat to democracy, but it's also kind of cool. So there's a company, and this is Alex that you see on screen, and he reached out to me, Alex Robinson of Vidon this week. And he just let me know that this technology was now available to actually be used in the marketing process and the sales process and even in customer success. Um, you might create those one-on-one -on -one personalized videos for prospects. Now you can do it at scale with a deep fake where the recipient's name is not actually something you say, but the video looks like you said it. I think it's fascinating. Um, but I wanted to kind of broaden my opinions on this. And I, I, I did that thing you're not supposed to do. I asked the internet what it thought about this technology. So um, th this is what you all said. Uh, Jason thinks it's just a whole bunch of spam, failing Christina. And I had a lot of people that responded with like gifts that were like, uh, no, and that's scary. You know, um, a lot of people just straight away do not feel comfortable with this. On LinkedIn, the, the kind of tune was the same. Rachel just responded with a bunch of the emojis like, ooh. Um, but some people actually could see the benefit of this right away. Douglas on LinkedIn here says, look, this is no different than what we do today with personalized you know, uh, first name mail merge and marketing automation. He says, it's given us the power to personalize messages for years, marketing automation. Does that make us less trustworthy? In fact, uh, Douglas said he'll use it with pride. It shows that we are using the latest tech, he says, and we'll do that for our customers also. I also asked my friend, Mike Levy. Mike Levy runs the market research firm, GZ Consulting. Um, he's a sales marketing tech expert. And what he says is this is very dangerous technology. He describes it as it puts into question objective reality, right? Instead of videos being a harbinger of authenticity, and an indicator that the rep has invested the time to create a short video like you might with uh, asynchronous video companies like Vidyard, Hippo Video, others. He says they would become emblems of deception. Emblems of deception. I, and Jay, I'm going to be asking you about this later. So please do let me know what you think about this when I, when I have you on. But uh, what do you all think about deepfake? I'm dying to know. Put it in the comments. Let me know. Uh, but it's my tech of the week because it's just something that I, I feel is wild, right? But I also feel it was only a matter of time before we saw tech like this. As for the sales process, it definitely is going to make more people open the email, feel like it was personalized for them. And of course, I can see it providing efficiency to firms who are going to use it to scale that process instead of spending the time on one to one. The problem is, given the state of trust between businesses and customers right now, which is 
at all time lows, this may not be a helpful way of reestablishing that relationship. So Alex, thank you for letting me use you today as a guinea pig and reaching out with this fascinating new tech. If you at home or watching are using this, let me know, I'm dying to talk to you. My quote of the week this week, I wish was fake. Like I wish this was a whole deep fake story because this comes from one of my favorite and most popular lunch spots. It used, okay, let's be honest. It was also like a hungover breakfast spot um, when I was working at my startup. It's called the Kitchen Cafe in Boston and it was in the financial district. I say was because the business said, as of last week, it's time to cut its losses. They were losing like 10 to 15K a month and it's time to close its doors. Uh, so my quote of the week comes from co-owner Jamie Valdez, who says the hardest part as an owner was the decision to close. I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. Still don't know if we did the right thing, but I just couldn't keep on. And I think that, I mean, my heart breaks, right, for this, this business owner, but this it illustrates a much broader trend. There are thousands of small businesses that are thinking exactly this right now. And it, you know, it kind of hides, I think, the reality of the situation, which is that this is an, a, pretty much an epidemic right now. The, uh, the, the numbers don't really help with this. Yelp, which does an economic uh, you know, recap, they just look at all the data they have on Yelp businesses. They found that nearly 100,000 establishments that temporarily shut down due to the pandemic are now out of business, like my friends at the Kitchen Cafe. Data from McKinsey shows that you know, this was a problem even before the pandemic. They found that a third of small businesses were operating at a loss, uh, even before you know, the pandemic crisis, or many of them were just breaking even. That number is greater if you're a restaurant. 40% of restaurants before the pandemic were operating at a loss or breaking even. And for them, they've had to deal with changing expectations. And I'm going to talk to Jay a little bit about how restaurants are keeping up. Um, but all of these expectations around cleaning and all the other uh, modifications came at a financial cost. And for restaurants, the operating margins are already slim. This matters, too, because these organizations are not only uniquely vulnerable to the pandemic, they play a critical role in the U.S. economy. Small businesses uh, constitute more than 99% of the U.S. businesses and employ 60 million people. So I think these stats illustrate how dire the situation might be. I don't mean to bring the mood down, but uh, I, you know, it, this is important, this matters. Jay is gonna tell us later um, advice, by the way, for business owners. Um, but before I bring on Jay, I just have one more story to share. And it is one of resilience and adaptation. It is my experience of the week if you have gone out to eat during the coronavirus pandemic, you have seen yourself in some really fascinating uh, experiences. So there's this fantastic outdoor dining trend of kind of putting you in igloos and yurts and God knows what. It's fascinating. I think it's very cool. I also think it's a little bit absurd. And we're going to look back at this and laugh. But this is adaptation. What's on screen now is the Envoy Hotel in Boston. You can get a great view of the Boston Harbor and skyline in an igloo as you enjoy dinner at Envoy Hotel's Lookout Rooftop Restaurant. If you find yourself in Deer Valley in Utah, your opera ski could be enjoyed in what's called an Alpen Globe. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, an Alpen Globe, right? Each one seats up to six people offering prime views of the slopes, um, but you also might find yourself in a, a yurt. This is a yurt in Austin, Texas at Arlo Gray. Uh, and you might be sitting in one of these one day. They're portable round tents, have you seen these? This is the new dining experience. If you're in a city like Manhattan, there are an oodles and oodles and oodles of options. This is uh, this is uh, Maria, which is a, now a restaurant that has this kind of festive, uh, fuzzy blanket filled, heater filled, decor filled outdoor experience. And so you can enjoy a complimentary hot whiskey cider as you reevaluate your life decisions. But I, I know what you're thinking. I know what's on your mind right now. And it's not just when is Jay coming, which is in one minute. It is what do I wear to an outdoor yurt dining experience? Luckily, The New Yorker had an article that I came across last week. And I love this title, dressing for dinner when dinner is in a frigid curbside yurt. These are the times we live in, my friends. Um, the author uh, tried on these kind of wearable sleeping bags, which I actually think is fabulous and would look very good. In. It hides all the flaws, right? He described them as wearable bed rolls, which make you feel like a boil-in bag vegetable. They have armholes, they have hoods, and they're meant to help you endure the cold no matter where you decide to eat dinner. I love the adaptations that businesses are making, but it's also requiring adaptations on the consumer side. Love to hear if you are uh, enjoying any of these outdoor experiences. Let me know how that's going for you. And if you found yourself in a sleeping bag, question also, can I just cut the hole out of mine and just wear 
No? Let me know. Um, when I come right back, I will be back with Mr. J. Bear. Do not, do not go away. You are going to want to hear what he has to say. Stay tuned. Okay, my friend, we are live with Jay Bear. Welcome back. Hello, Jay. Hello, Katie. <laughs> I got to tell you, this idea that you grew up with me oh. is offensive on several levels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm not that old, uh, actually, but I do appreciate uh, the kind words. Thank you. Fantastic to be here. Thanks to our good friends uh, at Oracle CX for bringing you this terrific weekly program from the genius that is Katie Martell. I got to tell you, the deep fake thing, so it's a true story, friends. Katie sent me uh, the deep fake email personalization thing a couple days ago, and I was so enchanted with it. I already have a demo set up for Monday. So this idea that it's going to be the ruination of the world, nope, I'm not here for that. I will be buying it any day now. Look, I started in politics. I was a political campaign consultant long before I did what I'm doing today. So this idea that somehow this will be the straw that breaks the camel's back around authenticity, nope, I'm not buying it. I knew you were in politics and I, I wondered if you were on that side of the table, you know, what this looks like. I, I can see an argument on both sides. Jay, will you promise to keep me posted on how you use it and how it does? Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, I, I, we do a lot of work with Vidyard uh, and, and love those guys. And I actually have done a lot of, of personalized videos using their technology, including things for book launches and all that. Um, and it's really cool, but this idea to just sort of do it automatically, I'm like, huh, you know, it, it's not perfect, right? So the way that, that Vidyard does it in other technologies is is a little, uh, well, significantly higher end and, and just feels more polished. But for this idea of, all right, I've got 300 contacts that I just wanna kind of do an initial touch um, and it won't cost me much to do that. I'm like, interesting. So we'll give it a shot. I gotta say as a recipient of it, I felt uh, first, hooked. I was like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. And then there was this layer of kind of like, uh oh, underlying dread. So I yeah, I think I think in this context, you're right. It's pretty innocuous. And but look, and I, I also feel like as a consulting firm owner, right, we work with lots of big companies all over the world. It is a requirement for me and my team to know what works and what doesn't work. Because right. at some point, a client's going to ask us what we think. So we have to have a POV on everything. <laughs> I want to know your POV on this after you've tried it. Um, and my friends, if you are I watching my POV this, on igloos and yurts, uh, oh, please, I'm dying I to know what you think of that. recently, uh, and and I dig it. But here's here's the the calculus that my wife and I went through. All right, so the good news is you're in an igloo um, and you're not swapping air with other diners, but that really only works with the people in the igloo are also in your household. So we were mm -hmm. going to go with some friends who are sort of in our bubble and be in the igloo. And then we're like, well, is that better or worse? And so there was that whole kind of calculation. But I love this idea that you mentioned in the in the early part of the show of, hey, you know what? If you have to eat and drink outside now and it's winter in New York or Boston or Rhode Island, well, that's just tough. You know, bring a coat. I saw a thing uh, today. I think it was in The Times or maybe The Post that some rooftop bars are putting in curling, like literally like giving it, doing curling bars now on your rooftop and teaching people how to, how to do that. I'm like, that sounds like a great adaptation. I'm into this. That's a great date night. I hope my wife is watching because I would like to be taken on a curling date immediately. I feel like curling is a recipe for a torn hamstring if you're not really <laughs> limber. Like if you really check it out, it's got, it's not as easy as it looks. No, and, but I do like how cool, you know, they kind of just like float. Yeah, you know, well, yeah. curling is just very elegant of a sport. It's like bowling, though. What you don't talk about enough in curling is the special shoes. So there are curling shoes. I know this to be true. The same way there are bowling shoes. If you just wear your sneakers when you're bowling, it's not really going to work. Curling the same way. So the whole shoe part could be a problem. I don't know. Jay, I feel like you are a uh, master of uh, facts that, you know, not everyone knows. Um, <laughs> yeah, is it possible for me to put that, that to the means. test? <laughs> <laughs> I think for today, I have a very specific way of uh, reason that I'm teeing this up. Um, by right. the way, if you don't know Jay Bear, I just put his books on screen. You should just Google right. him at the end. Um, but you also should know that Jay Bear has this incredible, um, I'm going to call it offer. So if you book Jay Bear to speak, 
Mm. You get to choose. I don't know if this is still true in a virtual age. You tell me. You get to choose the suit. You get to choose the plaid. Oh, 100%. Yeah, hundred percent still true. Yeah, uh, and, and actually, anybody can go there. It's dressjbear.com. Go right now. Dressjbear.com. Knock yourselves out. You can play with it. Um, just put test in your event name, so I will know it's not a real event, uh, and uh, you can uh, pick it out. I, I think this is both phenomenal and and brilliant, and it uh, just I think it's is it as cool as can, can I tell you the whole story on this? So. All right, th th you'll like this because it really is an experience story. Why do I always wear kind of bold plaid suits? Well, when you're giving a presentation in a conference, it is common, as Katie well knows, that attendees will want to ask you questions and, and hopefully say, well, can you come give a presentation at my conference after you finish uh, your remarks? Well, in a large conference, you can get lost in, in the sea of attendees, especially if you're wearing essentially what everybody else is wearing. So I started to wear uh, bolder, brighter patterns and, and such literally as a location device years and years ago, that if somebody wants to find me to ask me a question an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours later in this conference, oh, it's the guy in the green suit or the guy in the raspberry suit, what have you. Okay. And that worked really, really well. But it wasn't really an experience. It was a bullet point, a differentiator at some level, but it didn't really create any word of mouth about me. And then when I was working on my book, Talk Triggers, with my dear friend Daniel Lemon, I was like, well, this is silly. I, I need to kind of turn this into a talk trigger, turn it into a word of mouth generator. So what we did was create the application that I mentioned a moment ago, where now meeting planners get to actually pick the suit before I get there, which then makes them part of the gag. And now they have ownership of it. And they talk to one another about it all the time. My agent says that meeting planners always ask about the suit. Isn't Jay the one who gets to pick the suit? It's become something that they remember. And, and, and so when you realize that my actual customer is the meeting planner, not the audience, it becomes really very experiential at that point. My favorite part of that is um, I had Jean Bliss on the show last time, and, and what she Jean said to Bliss. me was, she's amazing. What she said to me was, uh, "Memories are the essence, right, of experience, and that's exactly what this is. Memorable. I mean, look at look at right now. And Jay, I'm so glad you brought up this point about suits and patterns and plaid because I'd like to play a little game before we start talking more serious about CX. Okay. Is that okay with you? Sure. Is that cheetah or leopard that you've got going? Today? <laughs> No idea. Or, I have no idea. Actually, no, I'm but, not entirely uh, certain I know the difference between a cheetah and a leopard. So let's go ahead and move on. I, if anyone else knows in the comments, could you please let me know? Um, but Jay, I'm I, not a uh, zoologist, Katie. <laughs> I know a lot of things, but zoology is not one of them. Listen, no, no harm on that. Um, but listen, it, it's time to get serious about patterns because I'm going to play a game with you right now that I hope you enjoy. It's called What the Plaid. Jay, you are somebody who is not only the best dressed man in this industry, but um, the variety, the sheer variety of the suits I think is, is baffling. And I thought my wife had a great suit collection. Shout out to Bindle and Keep. Your suit collection dwarfs it. And so I wanna have a little game with you where I'm just gonna quiz you. And uh, you are gonna win uh, some money, but that money's gonna go to charity and I'll tell you all about that after. Um, right. I'm gonna give you four patterns and all you have to do is tell me the name of that plaid pattern. Are you ready? Okay. Number one is on screen. This is a dominant plaid during the holiday season. You might find this plaid on a lumberjack or on the matching pajamas that you have with your dog. Jay, what is the name of this pattern? Um, is that a tartan plaid? I don't know. Ah, it is not. And it, oh, hold on one second. Oh, my, oh, my screen is uh, messing up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. It is buffalo plaid. Oh, buffalo, I did know buffalo that. Plaid. I do Ooh. actually have... Um, a onesie made out of that plaid. Picks or it didn't happen. Jay, number two is on the screen here. This plaid has pointy shaped checks shaped like a canines and scissor. So ch that hint I there. I believe is a... Uh, canines and scissor. Traditionally black and white. Tooth, dog's tooth plaid. Close, close. Hound, hound's tooth, there, hound's there it is. Hound's tooth. Yes, my friend. That, yes. It is in fact hound's tooth. Do you have one in this mm -hmm. pink color? I've seen black and white hound's tooth, but this pink is. I phenomenal. do have pink suits, um, including this one, which is immortalized in a bobblehead. Uh, but I don't think I have quite that hot of a pink. Oh, God. You know, you've made it when you have a bobblehead of yourself on your desk. Jay, number three is on screen, originating in a city that used to bear its name. Madras Plaid. Ah, there it is. Do you know the new name of, this, of the, uh, the town in which it now, what, what the town is now called? No, I do not. It is now Chennai, India. Look at that. Look at that. We are learning geography. We are learning plaid. Your final. Yeah, I'll tell you what, this is a multifaceted quiz. 
we're all about the multidisciplinary takeaways here. Uh, it's last one's on screen here. It's a checkered pattern made up of horizontal vertical stripes of the same color, first imported into Europe in the 17th century. Could be on a tablecloth, on a school uniform. Yes, that's sort of a gingham. Yeah, gingham. Yes, there you go. Fantastic. Jay, you did fantastic on I this. Did okay. I did okay. Buffalo I planet, I've forgotten. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And and most important, I think, of all of this is really that uh, because you did so well today, I'm just going to say that you got everything right. Um, I'm going to donate $100 for each of the questions you got right, which in my mind is now $400 to a great organization that actually helps with uh, girls that are coming from the world of poverty and exploitation, helps them get back to school, helps them break that cycle through education, including their uniform. So Jay, a donation of that uh, amount is going to be made in your name to her future coalition. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Katie, you, Katie. That's that. fantastic. Very kind of you. I mean, you know, we're just here. We're here to save the world. We're here to tell people how to improve their customer experience. We've tested your knowledge about Plaid enough. Um, you want to talk about some CX? Sure, if you want to. I, I would love to. I mean, really, what else do you want to talk about all day? Tequila, if I had my druthers, but it's okay. We'll talk about CX. What tequila are you going to have tonight? Uh, depends. I've got one coming in the mail. Um from a relatively new brand called Mahenta, hmm. which I'm really excited to try. Um, but I don't think it's going to make it today, especially because it's snowing. So probably I am going to get into some G4 Reposado, which is one of my very favorites. G4 sounds intense. Is that like a double shot? Nope. It's uh, It stands for fourth generation. Ah, um, not exciting. Yep, uh, fourth generation manufacturer. Um, enjoy that. Cheers. And I do, don't forget, want a picture of you in that Buffalo Plaid onesie at some point. All right. So selfie, please, tonight of you in the tequila and the Buffalo Plaid like onesie. It. Okay. Um, I want to start with a question uh, about last year. And it's a really uh, philosophical question. What the heck did we just live through? Can you tell me what 2020 looked like through your eyes and your point of view? Well, certainly unusual for me. I used to travel 200 days a year, and now I travel zero days a year. I haven't even picked anybody up at the airport um, since since last March, much less been to an airport myself. Uh, so I have traveled about that much for 16 years in a row, um, and then not at all. So it's been very unusual for me just in terms of how I spend my time, um, and, and clearly for lots of our clients and friends and, and everything else. It's, you know, I, I don't know anybody who hasn't been um, disrupted in, in, in some way that was kind of unforeseeable. But yet, then you also wonder, like I, I saw your comments earlier about small businesses um, going out of business and 40% of restaurants pre-pandemic uh, were only breaking even. And so I guess the question becomes, is, is that a pandemic consequence or is it economic Darwinism and it was going to happen anyway? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. But what I do know and what I have already seen and what I firmly believe is that it's rewritten the rules, that customer expectations have been changed forever. Uh, and there are going to be a lot of winners, real winners in 2021 uh, as well as some losers. And we've already seen that. There are some industries that have very much prospered. Slipper sales up 70% last year. Um, so if you're in the slipper game, uh, you had a great, great, great year. Um, other people, boat manufacturers, great year. RV manufacturers, great year. Wine makers. Um, one of my friends here in town um, owns one of the largest wineries in America. I know, in Indiana. I know that seems strange to us all. <laughs> Bizarre. But, but true. Uh, they were up 40% year over year. Wow. You know, that is major. Um, it's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars um, up. So um, the question is what happens when the pendulum swings back the other way or, or, or does the pendulum swing back the other way? I mean, I think there's some things that have changed that we're not going to go back to. Um, for example, I don't feel the need to ever have a face-to-face -face conversation with a pizza delivery guy. Amen, like I'm brother. cool with just leave it on the step. Just leave it mm -hmm. on the step. It'll ring the bell. It's good. Like we don't need to exchange pleasantries. And I also feel the need to not go, or I don't feel the need to go back to using filthy paper currency. Like I'm all good on tap to pay forever. Mm -hmm. Don't need to go back to that either. Right. So there are some things that I hope will persist. Um, time will tell, I guess. Time will tell. You know, I read about an airline who's actually trying to sell off the wine that it can now no longer serve on board. I don't remember which airline it was, but I it's now it was American. I saw that as well. You're right. 
Yeah. And, and I mean, they got to get rid of the inventory. Mm -hmm. um, you told me a really cool uh, example of, of a business near you that has been pivoting to kind of adapt to these times. Um, I wonder if you tell me about that now. Are we talking about the uh, the brewery? You got it. Yeah. So my friends at the Upland uh, Brew Company here in based here in Bloomington, Indiana, um, have a one, two, three, four, five, I think six restaurants as well as a brewery, um, brew pubs. No, no big surprise like that. Uh, but what I found interesting is that very early in the pandemic, they understood that guest expectations had changed. And even when they had the ability to have indoor dining, which is still um, possible here at, at some level, it comes and goes, um, they realized that even when people were allowed to eat inside, maybe they didn't want the same experience as they did pre-pandemic. As you may know, if you've been in the restaurant business and, and have seated uh, service with, with dining um, professionals, uh, waiters and waitresses and such, the thesis is always that you want to, quote unquote, touch the table, they call it, as many times as possible and make sure you're very attentive to the patron. Make sure that you refill the water glass and the iced tea and you need any ketchup and how are the fries and can I get your dessert and all those kind of things where the waiter is popping by all the time and saying, hey, um, you know, can I help you? And that has proven over time to increase diner satisfaction and subsequently increase gratuity. But maybe not now. When you're already a little on edge about how safe is it to eat inside this restaurant to begin with, and now you have this waiter or waitress who's also interacting with everybody else in the restaurant coming by your table, maybe you're like, hmm, maybe I don't want to be by that person as much. And so my friends at Upland put together these disposable paper coasters that are reversible and each time you go to eat there you get a coaster and one side says swing by the other side says catch you later and the diner gets to dictate when the wait staff comes by or doesn't come by so they don't have to come check on you the the wait staff is trained to look for the green and when you see the green go to the table which i think is genius and and is almost like a rip off of the brazilian steakhouse if you know what i'm talking about katie mm -hmm. like where you go mm -hmm. like break if, if the thing is green, bring me meat. And then if it's red, I can't eat any more meat. Um, it's kind of the same idea. And and this is a, a premise that, A, I have not seen at any other restaurant other than Upland. And maybe it's just me. But B, I'm like, why don't we always do this? This is such a good idea. This is one that should persist. You know, and I think that that, that experience that is created because of the pandemic, what a fascinating thing to leave and keep forever. I mean, you had a, a stat, I'm just going to show it up on screen super quick, um, that 60% uh, of consumers tried a business for the first time during mm -hmm. the pandemic and 89% yep. plan to stay with the new option. I find that fascinating. And I think it also changes the rules. Can you speak a little bit about how it changes the rules? Well, it changes the rules because I think everybody's sort of psychology is look. All right. If the whole world screwed up and you feel like you're just like in a snow globe that's been shaken up, why don't we just examine all of our options? Maybe it's time to play the field. The, the companion stat to this, Katie, is that divorces are up 34% um, since the pandemic, right? People mm -hmm. are like, well, you know what? Maybe it's time to seek other pastures. <laughs> but this is the 60% thing is so true. Um, I have a different chiropractor, a couple of different restaurants, a different person who we use for um, haircuts, like we've, we've made a lot of different buying decisions as a family since the pandemic, and a lot of people have. And it's because the criteria that you use to make a selection is different. Mm -hmm. What we value, the rank order of what we value has changed. Because now we might care more about safety than we do about price. We might care more about convenience um, than we do about price. In fact, 28% of consumers say that price matters less since the pandemic, despite the fact that many people have manifest economic difficulties right now. So this, and the story I keep telling everybody, all of this means two things. One, the customers that you've enjoyed for all these years have a wandering eye right now. They are looking at your competition in a way that they hadn't previously. And two, your competitors' customers are now looking at you in, in a way that they hadn't previously. So not only does it make it easier for you to go get new customers, it also makes it easier for your current customers to leave. So that's a double-edged sword. But it also means that 
what really is going to differentiate the winners and losers is not price, is not availability, is not supply chain. It is experience. That's what is going to make the winners win and the losers lose. I want to, uh, that's a tweetable moment if I ever heard one. Uh, and I think that this is what I think you mean when you say this is an opportunity in 2021, that this dire time actually presents very positive potential outcomes. I think, you know, the natural question that I'm going to ask, and I'm also going to bring in my friend Simon from LinkedIn really, really quick, but I want to ask you this question of how can businesses shorten that time for the comeback? I mean, there's opportunity there, but I think my question is what matters most and what's going to help now. But before you answer that, I have to tell you, Simon on LinkedIn says uh, he's seen the coaster thing, but he's seen it with pillows in a store. And I said, tell me more. And he said, well, they say yes on one side and uh, not tonight on the other. Simon, thank you for that. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. So, Jay, uh, how do we shorten the time to recovery uh, for I small like businesses? That. Your your best advice? Well, I'll tell you what my best advice is, uh, is to leave trails of certainty in your wake. What I mean by that is Podium just came out with new research that showed that 70%, 70% of consumers say that reviews matter to them more now than at any time in their life. And of course they do, because only a fool makes a buying decision in the middle of a pandemic without doing research. Consequently, what your customers say about you, either out of their mouth hole or in a review, is going to dictate in large measure when you come back to full economic health and whether you come back to full economic health. So if word of mouth wasn't important to you before, it better be important to you now. And if you're not really doing something in the operations of your business that is designed to create conversation, then you are doing your business a real disservice. The winners are going to have a story about the operation. I, you can't believe how clean it was. You can't believe how safe I felt. You can't believe how fun it was. You can't believe how cozy the igloo was. You can't mm -hmm. believe how fun it was to do curling or whatever. First and foremost, you got to make sure you execute well. But then secondly, you've got to have a story. And a story that your customers will tell one another Word of mouth will set you free in 2021. There's no way anybody can afford to advertise their way back to to full customer um, uh, volume. It just it just doesn't pencil. I think that's fair. I have to also ask: uh, Is there anything about crane kicks? that we can bring into this conversation. Uh, I have to give a shameless plug to a new resource that you sent me yesterday yeah. um, that I absolutely adored. And I wanna give a shout out to Christina, is it Pater? Um, yeah, who, Pater. who wrote it, just a, a really great, fantastic resource. I'm gonna pop it up on screen here. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about this? Cause I think the idea of story, right? Is very central to, to this ebook, which is all about Hollywood, specifically Cobra Kai. And I, by the way, was shocked, 73 million households. Isn't have watched crazy? over 73 million, which is the Karate Kid spinoff. If you're not familiar, it's on Netflix. It takes place 30 years after um, the Karate Kid events of 1984. But tell us about this idea of story and what it means uh, for businesses right now. Yeah, I, I think Cobra Kai, the spinoff, has more viewers than the movie ever did. I, I don't know <laughs> that that's true, but it, it feels like that's true. I'm not really sure. Um, so Christina is a Hollywood screenwriter. She's got a brand new book coming out called The Hollywood Approach. Uh, on February 10th. It's amazing. Go look it up on Amazon. Uh, she also works with myself and my team at Convince and Convert. And, and this ebook kind of explains how to infuse your content, which is, of course, a critical part of your business success, how to infuse your content with the key elements of a Hollywood script, things like story, things like character, things like flossomeness, uh, what she calls uh, things that are not perfect about characters, which make them interesting and memorable. And it's such good advice because so often people try to make content in their business, but it's just a brochure, right? If, if the content is just about you and has no story and no characters, it's just a brochure. If you want to call it a blog post or a video or a podcast, Okay, if that makes you feel better, but it's still just a brochure. So we created this ebook and it just came out literally yesterday. 
uh, all about how to make your content binge worthy this year. And, and it tells all the stories through actual scenes, et cetera, in Karate Kid and, and Cobra Kai. Uh, and the way I'm going to tie this back is if you thought it was likely that you would pull a hamstring doing curling, you would very much pull a hamstring um, doing karate. So the question I was going to ask of, will you do a crane kick right now? It's not going to happen. It, it sounds like no, you didn't stretch. No. should have told you. To. And I, and I may or may not be wearing pants. <laughs> There's always that risk. I don't ask questions on these virtual right. events. Right. Don't ask questions. I am, in fact, wearing slippers, um, and that is true, um, because a 70% increase in slipper sales uh, in 2020 cannot be ignored. Due to J. Bear's slipper habit. Um, there's one example, a uh, very cool campaign in that ebook um, from the Getty Museum about oh, okay. stories. Um, so I've got some examples on screen if you want to tell folks about it. Oh, so uh, this is early days in the pandemic. Um, I think it was April, maybe something like that. Um, obviously, museum closed. And I think the Getty in Los Angeles remains closed, if I have my information correct. And and they said, all right, we need to try to get people involved and engaged. And why are they going to pay attention to us in social media if they can't come here? So they, they kept posting um, different items from their vast collection. And obviously, they're online as well. And they asked uh, social media followers to recreate works of art from the Getty using only household items. And it is amazing the the lady with the field hockey stick there that's that's pro i mean there's some there's some gems uh in here and it's the kind of thing you're like wow that that idea will stand the test of time that will be in in marketing textbooks for a long while <laughs> i hope so and i think this it, what's at the core of this is that idea of show right don't tell and that to me is where the the idea of yes. marketing which is telling people what's up and the customer experience which is actually what they go through that's where it has to align and i think that's where we have to start to prioritize I'll what tell is the you experience what, i'll tell you what katie um that's such a good point on show not tell so what i do i think that's your point so <laughs> when, when i do when i do uh presentations depending on the industry there's like a, a sort of a a case study that I'll use sometimes about uh, hospitals. So hospitals having a real tough time in this country, not only are they besieged by COVID patients and, and have a lot of trouble with staffing and everything else correspondingly, but people are either afraid or in some cases prohibited from uh, going to a hospital for elective surgeries that is where hospitals make most of their money. So they got big, big foundational structural economic challenges. So they're trying to fight against that by communicating everything like, look, it's safe. Like, I know you think that it's not safe because of COVID, but probably the safest place is at a hospital, which probably is true. Uh, and and 99.999% of hospitals have this very, very, very long, comprehensive FAQ on all the things they're doing. And they sanitize this and they sanitize that. And here's how we take your temperature and blah, 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 blah. And you should totally do that. Everybody needs the ultimate FAQ right now because nobody knows nothing about nothing. Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody needs the ultimate FAQ right now, but it's better if you show, don't tell. So the example I use in my keynote is here's a really detailed written FAQ. And then here's a three minute video from a hospital in Iowa that actually is a video showing them cleaning everything. And it is so much more compelling and so much more visceral and memorable. It's, it's, uh, it's shocking how, how different it is. I love that. And and what a good example, right, of the power of, of visual. I think in the ebook, it was something like our brains process uh, visual information, right? Something like yes. 60,000 times faster. It, I don't quote me on that. Unfathomable. Yeah, it it's is. Crazy. It makes a huge. In this particular video, uh, one of the things that really um, that people notice is they show workers sanitizing the legs of the chairs in the waiting room, the legs. And you're like, OK, if you're wiping down chair legs, not arms, but legs, and, and they're showing everybody like, you know, cleaning the elevator buttons and everything else, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. They're serious about this. It definitely proves the point. And I, I totally agree with that. Um, I've got two kind of lightning round questions for you if you're okay. up for answering them. Uh, number one is, um, we've talked a lot about restaurants, we've talked a lot about mm -hmm. hospitals. Can we talk B2B? Are, are there any B2B organizations that uh, surprised or delighted or maybe infuriated you? Uh, you <laughs> provocateur is, is, is appropriate here. Um, and how they responded to COVID-19 and, and maybe set them up for an advantage this year? I, I mean, tons. And especially those who understand that they're not necessarily in the business that they think they're in. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what we did because I know the case study because we did it. 
in the first seven days after COVID really hit, um, so we're talking kind of early to mid-March, our team from scratch strategized, created, and published six different eBooks on topics that are important to our clients during the pandemic, especially the early days. Things like how to run a remote team, which we've been doing for 13 years, how to run a virtual event, how to modify your social media content for the pandemic times, and on and on and on. And what we did first was send those out to every existing client. And then we concentric circled it out to, to potential new clients and, and the world. Um, and, and as a result of that and a lot of other things, uh, it ended up being a very successful year. But you've got to understand that in B2B in particular, you're in the business of your clients succeeding. And if they succeed, you'll succeed. But you've got to think about it as as one step removed and say, all right, what are we really trying to solve for here? And what I did see is a lot of B2B organizations um, trying to sell whatever they sell um, with a greater sense of urgency, thinking that maybe everything's going to stop. And, and I don't believe that is the appropriate success equation. That's fair. And I, I think a lot of us uh, experienced both, both ends of that spectrum, right? As as people that were receiving pitches, giving pitches, it was hard yeah. to know exactly what was going to work last year. And I think it it strikes me as crazy that it's been almost a year that we've been at this. I don't feel any more knowledgeable about what's going on than I did a year ago. Do you feel the same way? No. Um, because now... I know what this what this is like, so I feel perfectly comfortable with this environment. Um, I know how to succeed in this environment. I know um, how to capitalize at some level on that uncertainty and how to help people through it. The only thing I don't know is is what's on the other side, but mm. whatever, live in the moment. You'll you'll deal with it as it comes. Yeah, uh, that's I a mean, very like, like what's the point? Thing. Like I'm, like I don't know. I don't know when this is going to end and I don't people spend a lot of brain cycles thinking about what's the next normal and what's going to happen after this is over. I'm like, let's just deal with this right now. And then we can deal with, you know, everybody has a vaccine and we get back to normal later. Um, I, I know what you need to do to make sure that um, your position to succeed in those times, focus on customer experience, focus on word of mouth, focus on customer experience, focus on word of mouth, focus on customer experience, focus on word of mouth. Those are the two things you should do. But I don't really know the mechanics of that because I don't know if it's going to come back fast or slow or never. And I don't want to waste time worrying about it. Call me when it's over. <laughs> wake me up. Wake me up when this wake is over. Wake me up before yeah. you go, go. And then I'll give you a new set of uh, recommendations then. Well, it, it is actually very comforting. And, and thank you for being honest about the fact that, you know, you live in the moment and you plan with what the information you, you have. I think that is very comforting to know, though, that the principles that you've been advocating for for years, pre-pandemic, word of mouth, customer experience, they feel timeless. And that is there is some comfort there. There is some stability and some consonance there that I think a lot of people are looking for. So thank you for that. Yeah, My I, last question I, for I you. The pandemic has proven me right. Like, I really <laughs> do. Like, you know, especially about word of mouth. Um, yeah. You know, I've been preaching it uh, for a while now, since before it was cool, I guess. And and now everybody's like, oh, geez, yeah, this is going to be pretty key. Um, and you realize when a lot of your other ways to create awareness um, have been mitigated or taken away that really all that stands between you and ruin is your reputation and your customer's willingness to tell people to buy from you. Mm -hmm. That's all you got really guys, mm -hmm. right? You have your reputation and your customer's willingness to do sales for you. That's it, right? So lean into that. I do, excuse me. I do love that. There was something also yesterday when we were chatting about um, there were there were those companies that they saw massive growth last year Huge. due to the kind of environment around them. You mentioned boats, RVs. What is your Super. thoughts? What are your thoughts and your advice for them? The ones that did see the Crocs. spike. In Crocs money? are up like Crocs, are like fifty percent increase last year. Are they really? Crocs. Stop it! Stop Sorry. it! Sorry, Stop it! Do you, do you own Crocs? Have you ever owned Crocs, Katie? I have owned a Crocs. And I will leave it at that. 
<laughs> my mother next said it's can't sign next week's show is going to be Katie and Crocs. I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> Tune in. Crocs. If anyone sends me Crocs, I promise to wear them on screen. I'm excited. Leopard Go for it. print clog. They're made for boats, and I yet do not have a boat. But anyway, tell me what your advice is for those folks that, like Crocs, saw that spike last year. Well, you can't take it for granted, especially those who had a spike, as most did, who had a spike, that was driven by fundamental changes in consumer behavior that may or may not persist, right? So everybody wants to boat and RV and drink wine and wear Crocs and, and wear slippers because they're not in the office and they can't travel the way they used to travel. And I've done several um, speeches in those industries over the last few months. And what I tell people every time is you've got all these first timers, right? First time Crocs buyers, first time boat buyers, first time RV buyers. Two of my friends bought boats and RVs for the first time recently. And there's great amount of uncertainty as a first timer in those kind of subculture activities. And what's happened is these, these organizations have grown so fast with a big spike in interest that their customer experience has gone down, not up. So now you've got all these first time buyers who have a less than great, and in some cases, even a less than adequate experience, who are then engaging in negative word of mouth with their friends. And what's gonna happen is you've got this first ring of new customers based on the pandemic, and you're never gonna get a second ring. And you're gonna look back five years from now and say, remember 2020? Man, that was a good year. And it will be a blip, not a boost. It'll just be a, a, an outlier point on a spreadsheet if you don't get the experience right. You want boosts, not blips. Boosts, they not blips. blips. I cannot I believe how many, how many people in those kind of industries, those growth industries, didn't add staff. It's like, <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. Um, and literally, I had a conversation with somebody in the boat business. I said, well, how many, how many new customers does an average salesperson handle? He said, well, before the pandemic, an average salesperson handled 40 new customers every quarter or month, whatever. And now they handle double that. I'm like, okay, so you've got all these new buyers who don't know anything about boats, who are going to ask more questions than the long time. Mm -hmm. And you are setting it up on purpose so that your sales team has half as much time as they did before to answer questions. I get where it comes from, that okay. uncertainty, but yeah, I, it, it, I feel like the perspective is necessary. The reminder that this is about investing in what's in the long term. The short term boost is exciting, but what's going to matter in the long term is what you invest in these early customers. You know That's great. Money, you know who made money in the gold rush, Katie? Oh. The guys who sold shovels and pickaxes <laughs> yep, fair but else fair shovels and pickaxes so you you know is customer experience the sexiest thing you can do in your business no it's not but that is the shovel and the pickaxe in your business and so more than ever you have to really spend time saying good enough is not enough Customers, it's been a year, as you said, customers are not going to give you a pandemic pass anymore. The thing that drives me the craziest right now, here comes a rant. I'm just going to tell you guys right now, rant on the way. Every time I buy something online, which is constantly, uh, you get the pull down at the top of the e-commerce site that says due to COVID-19, it's going to take us an extra 14 days to send you uh, a sweater or whatever. And I'm like, bro, it's been a year. If you can't get your operations dialed in in a year, when are you ever going to get your operations dialed in? You can't, you got to quit using the pandemic as an excuse to have a crappy CX. Doesn't hold water anymore. Not going to stand for it. That is a provocative stance, Jay. I, I think you're right. I also have a lot of respect and admiration for companies that are uh, keeping things going. There's some, there's supply chain issues, right? There's, there's delivery, last mile issues, a, a lot of things disrupted by the pandemic that I feel like is out of these businesses control. But I do think you're right. I think it's a matter of what you can control, you should. And I think yeah. that's for the quarter advice. If you do have genuine issues, then going back to what we said before, show, don't tell. Don't just tell me it's going to be a 14 day delay. Say some orders may be delayed. Click here to find out why. And it's a video from your CEO talking about, or even an explainer video, looking at your supply chain. Like, like, show me. Don't expect that just because you've let me know it's going to take two extra weeks and I'm okay with that. 
I love that. I really do love that advice. And again, this is an opportunity. Not only is it a difficult situation, it's actually an opportunity to improve CX. We are running up on our time. And I want to ask you one final question before I let you get back on with your plaid filled day. Are you ready? Sure. What is one thing you never thought you'd buy, but you did because of 2020? Oh, how much time do we have left in the show? <laughs> um, okay. So I have had a boat for a while. I grew up on a lake. I've had a boat for, I don't know, four or five years, but I never did any fishing. Uh, I am an avid endorsement, generally speaking. And my friends and I, all who used to travel, none of us travel now, we started in spring um, when the weather got decent here, a Wednesday night fishing club called Bite Night. Uh, and and some combination of the six of us socially distanced uh, would fish every Wednesday night. So in 2020, I have bought four fishing poles, <laughs> at least six uh, reels, several things of extra line, a lot of a lot of bait uh, and lures and tackle boxes and and all of it. So a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Thanks to Jay Bear, fishing gear is also having a banner year. It is. I'm actually emceeing the fishing conference in two weeks, and it is having a crazy year. Now, will you be showing that picture of you and like the galoshes with the fish that's like eeny bitty, but you're holding it up with pride? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Part, you know? yes. No. yes. I'll tell you one of my greatest ideas of the year, though. Please. So I'm emceeing this thing, and and it's always a challenge. How do the sponsors get value right now because it's yep. virtual? And we can go to the trade show booth and all that. So I said, well, what if we just allow the sponsors um, to send me stuff and I'll wear it on camera? It's a three day event. And so I have a closet full of like of like jean brand sweatshirts and hats and like I am like in water bottles. It's my best idea ever. So from now on, anytime I MC an event, uh, I will wear your your logo for sure. Oh, that is phenomenal. I'm going to be sending you something. I'm going to custom make you a hat that just has my face on it. And I'm going to say, please. Please. Oh, you're like a race car driver. How? What a brilliant idea. This is going to be know. the new thing. I, you're going to be the first, but there will be other speakers that copy this. Please do. Happy to help. <laughs> Jay, I really want to thank you for being part of this today. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen, but um, I had these series of plaid puns that I made. I'm only going <laughs> to make you suffer through one. And I'm going to tweet out the rest after this, but I really That's have a good one. I like that very much. That. Yep. Do you, do you like that uh, I'm Patrick Swayze and that you make a lovely Jennifer Gray? I do make a lovely Jennifer Gray. There's no question about that. Who knew? Who knew? Jay, anything, any last words for our guests before I let you go? Just want to say thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to Oracle for putting it together as always. Uh, pretty easy to find. If anybody has any questions and wants to wrap about this, uh, reach out. I think that Jay Bear, you are my friend, one of the most, um, not only consistent, and like I said, I've been learning from you for years, but always very, very actionable. Every time I've left one of your talks, and I've seen many, I think I've learned how to be a speaker from Jay Bear. Um, oh, I come away with like actual things that you write down and go, oh, I can actually do something with this. Thank you for that. It means that you're doing the work to figure out how this translates from theory to practicality. So on behalf of everybody who's ever seen you speak, thank you a lot. <laughs> All right, Jay, I'm kicking you off. My friends, uh, you have just lived through another episode of Experience TV. Um, and like I said, take a look at uh, the resources that I linked to um, that Jay Bear mentioned. It's a great, fantastic resource. Um, and you can find everything that you've heard today at smartercx.com. So big thank you to our sponsors, Oracle CX, uh, which is part of uh, Smarter CX is part of. Uh, as always, we end these shows um, with 15 seconds of Zen. Uh, the, the following 15 seconds is actually a, a photo or a video from my backyard this morning. A little bit of snowfall in Boston. I hope you take these 15 seconds to just breathe. These are wild times. This is going to be a great year if you follow some of this advice um, and keep your, your spirits up, my friends. Thank you for watching. It's been a great episode. Uh, thank you again to Jay Bear, and I will see you all next time on Experience TV.